right. I'm gonna just finish doing it. Greetings. Hi. So cool. Mm -hmm. Can we have me? Here they come. <laughs> the fellows move in packs. <laughs> <laughs> What is a gaggle of fellows, a group of fellows, is a, a philosophy? This is amazing, wow. <laughs> All right. um, I'll be right back. Okay. That might be Jane. Let's see, she's still calling in. All right. This makes me so happy. This is probably one of the largest Zoom calls we've done right here. Look at all of you. Wow. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Greeting. Did you Hello. come out? Hi, 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 Wow. Hey, there's Marty. Hi, Marty. Hi, Marty. This is John, Marty. This is Summer. Yeah. So we can um, Jen Marie's here. Jen Marie, we can't see you. And maybe Jen Marie's muted. I'm not sure. Yeah, can't see us. We're right here. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello. Greetings. Hi. Yeah. This is wonderful. Isn't this awesome? Isn't it? It gives me like goosebumps. Oh my god, we are like fellas from all the cohorts. This is great. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you Zoom is a wonderful platform, as you can all mm -hmm. see. All right. yeah. So I just spoke to Chief Phil. Maybe you don't like someone's Hold arriving on, on a jet right. plane. Thank you. That might have been if you think you're in a noisy spot, you can mute yourself right there on the, your little square. So are you guys aware that there's a, quite a uh, cultural flashpoint going on in America right now with uh, Standing Rock? So what's happening when the person speaks, there's a I would wait. yellow line yeah, around their box, though. So that's why we can detect where the noise is coming from. OK. I have to take a picture of all the fellows on one page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's here. We could all say hi at the same time, Ella. You could do a little video. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Are we recording hi. this, John? I am. Okay. And I just muted the 617 number. I thought it might be where it was coming from. There it is hereditary there chief. Phil. Good morning, good morning. Hello, all right. Brother Phil. You're wall to wall fellows here, Phil. Oh, wall to wall. Distinguished, beloved fellows. Yes. Look at all their glowing faces. Memory. Hi. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, Semre, C E M R E. We're sorry. To mute I you. muted you only because there was some background noise. Yes, you're waving it. Awesome. And, Phil, as we're waiting here for more to arrive, I was just wanting to alert the fellows to what's going on in Standing Rock and what a remarkable cultural flashpoint. And Phil was just there. If some of you don't know, it would be great, Phil, if you'd be willing to share with us a little bit, just to put in context this moment in time, what's happening on Mother Earth here. Yes. Um, first of all, what I'd like to do, if I may, is to share a song. Okay in a prayerful manner, so we can bring our hearts and minds together as one in a good way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know that in looking at the path, the sacred path that the Dalai Lama fellows are following, that meditation and reflection is, is part of that whole journey. So I'm gonna sing a song that I think reflects what's happening at Standing Rock, what's happening today 
and what it is that we all have before us. And the song is an old song, one of four songs given to us by the white buffalo calf woman who was the sacred woman who brought us all our sacred teachings to the Ocheti Shakalin, which is the great Sioux nation. And the words say, Wayankie, Chinupa, Kile, Wakanyala, Wayankie. Wayankie says, calls upon and summons the holy power and all our ancestors to come and be with us. And then it says, Chinupa, Kile, Wakanyala. It says the sacred pipe, the holy of holies, but it's not in a physical sense that, because we know the spiritual has infinite meaning. It means the bowl of that pipe, which represents the mineral people, has the spirit of cohesion or unity. The stem, which is intimately related to the earth, all the plant people, they're sacred. The mineral people are sacred. Then if you have a sacred pipe, with that sacred pipe are always symbols of the animal world, you know, eagle feather, whatever. That's saying they're sacred. Then if you turn the pipe this way, here's the mouth of the pipe, that's the human being. And when you put those two pieces together, the bowl, which is the mother, and the man, which is the stick, and put them together, that is a formulation there of life itself. And so that's where the human being is, the mouth of the bowl of the pipe. So it says, this is sacred. Behold, the mineral, the plant, the animal, the human, it's all one and sacred. That's what this song says. So I'll just sing four verses of this song, and then we'll, we'll begin. Why, <clears throat> Why on Kie? Why on Kie? Why on Why on Why on I'll save those last two verses for when we close this visit. Okay, okay. So first, uh, if we could, in the traditional way of the Dakota people, if we could have each person, I know uh, beloved brother John and uh, his beloved uh, Summer, but if, if we could begin with Bella and John, if you could have each one just, just share your name, where you're from, and what you'd like to have from this call. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Vela. Um, I grew up in India, grew up in Texas, and found my way to California. Um, and I'm just looking forward to hearing um, insights from all of our amazing fellows from around the world um, about their reflections and experiences um, with compassion. Great, thank you. I guess Kumar is next. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Kumar Kunal Jha. And uh, Kunal means the person who sees beauty in everything. Uh, I'm from Mumbai, India. And uh, I'm here to see beautiful people, uh, like so many beautiful people at one platform, and also to embrace the change and the compassion that we are trying to get to. So that's my motive and purpose of being here. Great. Wow. Wonderful. Blessing. Yes, blessing. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, blessing, I think you're muted. Let me see, blessing. Mm -hmm. We can't hear you. We can see you, though. She's not muted, so. We're not muted on our end. Oh, okay. Maybe she is. Let's see. You give can her type her. in the chat if that works better. With me, please. Okay, wait, Blessing, I see you are muted now. I'm unmuting you. Talk now. Oh. Oh. Shoot. Hi, Blessing. We can see you. I just unmuted you. 
Mm. Maybe we could come back to blessing. Okay, blessing, yeah. There's something with the microphone there. And if not, we can use the chat too. She can type in the chat. Yeah. Does she know where that is? On the bottom <laughs> of the screen, there's mm. Call out another one, Phil. We'll find him. Yeah. Okay. okay. There's mm -hmm. Alec on the top there. Hi. Okay, Alec, please share. Uh, my name is Alec. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, in the United States. Um, and I'm just excited to talk about how compassion can change the world and how we all are sitting here um, as Compassion and Action Fellows and we all hope to make some sort of difference using compassion in the world. And I'm just excited to have this space available to all of us. Yeah, wonderful. wonderful. Why don't you take this chair, Marty? I don't need to. No, I'm just gonna... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Phil. You call and I'll, I'll make sure it works. Okay. Uh, I see another. This is only one, two, three of us here. No, oh, no, no. You change your part. view. Go to this gallery view. Oh, okay, I'm sorry here. I'm going to have to learn all these things. Okay. Well, we have Elizabeth. <laughs> well, hold on. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Copy. Um, so I'm from Southern California. I'm sitting at UC Irvine right now. Um, and I think I'm looking to um, get in, re inspired and continue to perpetuate inspiration and um, see what can become from the conclusions that we draw from this space. And I'm honored to be here. Great. Thank you. So wonderful. And how about? How about DLF or DLF is on top on the phone? But let's go over here to uh, Simri. Simri? Simri, hold on. I'm going to unmute you, Simri. You had some background noise. Let's see. I think the deep picture is. We already got Simri. Yes, okay. Okay. Hi, my name is Demet. Uh, I am from Istanbul, Turkey. And I just, yeah, Turkey. And I would like to reconnect with Evelyn Salon and meet with new compassionate earthlings to restore my faith in humanity once again. <laughs> Great. Said. I think, Blessing, we can hear you. We can hear you, Blessing. Yeah. Yay! Hey. Hi, Blessing. Hello. Blessing it is. We can hear you. Oh, thank God. My name is Blessing. Mm. I'm from Nigeria. High school in Costa Rica. And right now I'm in the US. All right. For me, my expectation from the call is to get more wisdom, more inspiration, and to be able to connect to all of you. Wonderful. So nice. How about DF there? I think he's, I see him on the screen. He's using his phone too. Yes. D Fisher. We see you and we. Yeah, D Fisher. He's chatting. Oh. Hi, John. I'm the 617 number. Okay. Got it. Okay. Oh, I see. Let me unmute you. Oh. Got it. You're on. Okay. We should hear you now. Great. Thank you, John. Did that work? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, my name is David Fisher. I'm delighted to reconnect with everybody in this group, connecting with many for the first time, and hear your perspectives uh, from from the different classes of fellows over the years. Fabulous, David. Thank you. So David's, we can see his video through the camera, and he's talking on his phone. That's why he's got two boxes. Yeah. Got mm -hmm. it. All right. And we also have um, DLF Development, who's on the phone, too. Yes. We can hopefully hear her voice. Hello, my name is Natalie. Can everybody hear me? Hi, Natalie, yes. we can. Yes. Hi, John, how are you? It's great to see everyone's faces this morning. Yes, I dialed in through my phone so I don't disturb other people in the office with um, the recording or the audio on my computer. But I have just returned from uh, 10 days in Bali and um, tapping into the sacred spirit of the land there. And I am joining this call in the spirit of unity and compassion and all that the fellows embody um, around the world. So seeing everyone's faces gives me not only hope, but inspiration for um, not just this week, but the future. And uh, the global unity piece is really speaking to me right now and tapping into the sacred, as you said, Phil. 
Yeah, Wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Now, we have Marley on the phone. Is, can she speak uh, to the whole group via phone, John? Or uh, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Okay, Marley, you're on. All right. Hey, everybody. This is Marley. I'm from planet Earth. Whoa. <laughs> really? <laughs> I grew up in Joshua Tree, and I'm speaking to you live from Berkeley. Um, shoot, so I'm on this call to hear all my family. That's why I'm on this call to be in, in purpose, spirit, and magic, and to really deep, deeply um, connect with the, the oneness, the heart that we are um, as we talk about compassion and we talk about, you know, these things that light us up and what's going on around the world. Wonderful. And where was it that you were from? Was it Berkeley? I'm from planet earth but i'm speaking yes. to you from berkeley, berkeley. i am speaking from berkeley yes okay. i was born in, i was born in israel if that's helpful okay, wonderful. okay one thing i should say guys just to kind of fill you in first up, natalie thank you so much for all the support with the dalai lama fellows okay clf fellows dalai lama fellows development okay marty and bella are from dalai lama fellows but we're recording this but today actually is the 14th and the torch is in berkeley Yesterday, we carried it from Stanford at the Center for Compassion, Altruism, Research, and Education. And today, it's at the Greater Good Science Center. I just wanted to point it out because Marley is actually in the neck of the woods where the torch is. And the torch is headed your <laughs> way after Oprah and Louis Schwartzberg tomorrow. Then it goes to the Dalai Lama Fellows, technically. So we're recording yeah, this so on the 14th, and we'll share it on the 16th. I just wanted to make that point, though. Yes. That's really well, um, serendipitous, because we're having an event with the Greater Good Center later this evening. So. Wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Well, we're all now about we have, honoring that organization today, all over uh, social media, and talking about what we appreciate about that organization as part of um, lighting up the torch wherever it is. And it go, it's going around the world. Okay. Now we have, there's three, three relatives uh, that have telephone numbers. Uh, and I don't know if they can, if they can speak, but there's a 617, okay. Here we have somebody right here. That Meta Marley, I just muted you because it started to do that feedback. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Phil. Uh, so we have a uh, relative on the phone number. So just, if you have not introduced yourself, just yes. please... Uh, uh, share who you are uh, so we can know okay. where you're coming from and what you'd like to have on the call. What about I know this is time, but each one of us is a very sacred being, and I just want to he feel who's here. Okay. So there's still a couple of folks with names other than with numbers. How about Sadaf? Tamur? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. perfectly. All right. I am Sadaf from Pakistan. And I'm living in Pakistan right now. I'm here, first of all, to learn from my fellows what they say about compassion and how compassion can make a difference <coughs> in our society. And obviously, I want to share my reflections as well, what I learned from this fellowship and what are my, um, what are, what are my thoughts about compassion and how we can change this world through compassion. And I am really glad to be here. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And Nathalia, I'm going to unmute you, Nathalia. Hi. Yeah. I'm Nathalia, and I, I was born in Brazil, but I'm now in Norway, enjoying this wonderful nature and this land, uh, connecting with wonderful people. And I'm really excited to be in this call to um, just be present now here with my energy and um, connect with you all and learn and hopefully also inspire those who will be watching this video later. Awesome. All right, there's a couple of phone numbers like Phil was saying. I think Sarah also is here with us, but Sarah, you're muted. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. I'm from Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm here just to get inspired by all of these amazing fellows um, and learn some more about compassion and what your all thoughts are on it. Beautiful. All right, let's try some of these phone numbers. There's a 415-874-9010. Hi, 
That might be me, John. This is Marty. Hi, everybody. Oh, Marty, hey, Marty. You're all here. Oh. That's perfect. Well, oh, that's great. So I can only be here for. I, we have a um, conversation scheduled at ten with um, Amy Rao, whom some of you have met, who's the chair of our advisory board. So I didn't go on with a photograph, and I'm just kind of lurking. But it's just absolutely astonishing to see you all on the screen. Aww. And I, I just love that we're doing this. And thank you, John, for the initiative. And we can't wait to get the torch. Absolutely. Marty. Fabulous. All right. How, and then 617 is David. You heard from, how about the 650-814-2469? Hey, that's uh, me. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Hey, I'm Rajiv Ramdeo. I'm uh, living in Mountain View, California these days, although I was born in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, speaking of the Greater Good Center, um, I got a newsletter from them that talked about awe, and I think it's very fitting for this conversation because I think I'm here to uh, get my dose of awe from really inspiring people. Um, and I think I, I w I'll, I'll receive a lot more than I could probably give. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And 415-814-2637. Maybe that's... Before you do that, John, could I just say this, Marty, again, the awe document was actually from Dalai Lama Fellows. We're having a gathering tonight at 6.30 at the San Francisco Foundation. If anyone on the call is near the Bay Area or has friends here, they'd like to let us know about this. If you'll email Bella after this call, we can circulate back to you this invitation. Mm. Great. With awe and compassion, and it's jointly with Dalai Lama Fellows on the Greater Good Center. Mm. Perfect timing, there are no accidents. Well, I just have a question, will any of it be available on Facebook Live or anything like that that we can share out over our social media streams about the event, or will anything of it be? available for others to see that aren't there yeah we can make that happen yeah let's do that because well, that would be I'd so great to, to share to share Facebook that. live we've been doing it all over the the torch route so that would be fabulous for us yeah. to spread that word it's perfect timing yeah. all right so I think have we heard from everybody then I, so. I haven't gone yet ah. oh yes Hi, Ritu. Hi, um, I'm Ritu. I'm from Mumbai, India, but I go to university in Abu Dhabi, so that's where I am right now. Oh, I am here to be rejuvenated by stories of compassion and kindness. I'm excited to see the Dalai Lama fellows again. Now, Ritu, are you aware that there's many teams from the United Arab Emirates that are playing and in Abu Dhabi in the games? Oh, wow. I, I did not know that. Um, is it possible for you to connect me with them after this call? Absolutely. In fact, it's all happening right. I just got a message from Brione. So Brione, in the, is it Tempo magazine? We're on the Feel front Feel the page. Tempo. Feel the Tempo magazine has the that. Compassion Games on the front page. It's the cover. Okay. And an That's insert there. really good to know. I will definitely look it up. Mohammed's Center for Cultural Understanding. Ah, right, right, right. That's yeah. a really well-known center. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm I know, I know. Well. It truly is happening all over the world. It is yeah. humbling. And you know, I didn't say this, but Chief Phil, is, the hereditary Chief Phil Lane Jr., is the chairperson of the Compassion Game. And it was our meeting with the Dalai Lama at the Seeds of Compassion in Seattle in 2008 that birthed this compassion movement. We started then the Compassionate Cities campaign, and that was with Mayor, um, in Seattle, we were the first city to affirm the charter. And then we had this remarkable number of other cities get involved, and one city was outstanding, was Louisville, Kentucky, and their mayor. And we honored them for their great work with the Muhammad Ali Center and other things there. And then he wrote a letter saying they were the most compassionate city in the world and would be so till proven otherwise. And that's what birthed the Compassion Games, the largest compassion competition in the world. Now, of course, you cannot lose the Compassion Games, and the more people play, the more people win. So we're thrilled that you know I'm able to share Phil, and it's through Phil that I've had a great privilege to meet elder sister Jane, as he refers to, and I just thank you guys for being here. Jane Goodall. Yeah, mm -hmm. Dr. Goodall. 
So I think we had one more fellow, um, Majak, join us from um, Indiana. Okay. Majak, if you just wanted to say hello. Please. Hey, everyone. This is Majak um, calling in from the University of Notre Dame, Indiana. All right. Bella, Bella can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. And Phil, I would like you to continue to guide us. The thing that I wanted to just say when we thought deeply about what does global unity mean? Because it sounds so nice, but what are we really talking about? How would we define that? And we talked about the idea that people from all over the world with different nationalities, different cultures, different belief systems and different backgrounds could commit to live and play and learn and work well together. And for us, that kind of started the conversation about what global unity would look like. And that there's unity and diversity and the appreciation and recognition that we are one human family and it all takes these different shapes and forms. So Phil, I, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I also just want to say hi. I'm Summer Albertson, and it's an honor to be here on this call with all of you. And I just feel so much heart in from all of your faces. And I'm looking forward to getting to know more about uh, what you all do and how what compassion means for you in this conversation with Brother Phil Lane. And I'm on the leadership team with the Compassion Games, part of this global unity games movement that's happening all over the world and just really grateful to be here. Uh, Summer is the international relations coach working with teams all over the world and leads our social media efforts as well. And actually today we're honoring the fact that it was two years ago during the Compassion Games that we met in Seattle at the Compassion Activation Station <laughs> that some friends had set up and uh, in the spirit of transparency, not only do I honor and respect Summer as a partner in the Compassion Games, she's also the love of my life. So it's really beautiful that she's here and that we're together today in this moment. All right. So Phil, yeah, go ahead. Well, Mitaki Epi, my very beloved relatives, we are living in the day of the fulfillment of sacred prophecies. Across the Americas, prior to other relatives coming here in our predestined meeting, there were over a hundred million indigenous people living across the Americas. And across the Americas, we had sacred prophecies. Welcome to Verizon Wireless. Okay, hold on. The wireless customer you called is not available at this time. Please try your call again later. Announcement one, switch four, zero, dash four. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that was interesting. Yes. So, um, over 500 years ago, there was prophecies all across the Americas that in essence said a great, great spiritual winter time was coming. A time in which the union of the condor, that's the indigenous people of South America, the Quetzal, those are the people of Central America, and the Eagle, the people of North America, this union of the condor and eagle would be broken. And we, there's some really heavy feedback coming somewhere. Yeah, I, I don't hear that, but. Uh, I'll just keep going. It's, it's got some, it's, there's some kind of rumbling coming in there someplace. Anyway. Uh, themselves, um, until they feel like speaking and then we can unmute themselves. I agree. That's all right. Uh, so, so this, this great uh, uh, spiritually based union, which we called uh, the, re the union of the condor, the quetzal and the eagle, and was really based on what we call kinship trails. These were trading routes that went clear across the Americas. And of course, this spiritual wintertime that was being prophesied in many different ways, we had no understanding really of what this really, really meant. Because uh, if you were to s 
see the history of the Americas, especially in the High Plains, there was very little conflict. Uh, there was conflict, obviously. But in comparison to what was happening in many places of the world, there was very little, little uh, conflict. And this was an extremely, extremely rich, rich, uh, 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 rich union. In fact, more than 70% of all the food being eaten in the world today came from the indigenous peoples of the Americas. It was, it was actually domesticated here. There was not uh, the capacity to have a currency system until all the gold and silver that we had here was exploited and taken to the rest of the world. Now I'm saying that with the understanding that this process of colonization has been going on since the beginning of recorded history. But now, according to our prophecies, they said this would go on for 500 years. And during this time, uh, those that kept to, to, to their prayer and meditation and those things, in the end, when this new springtime would come, it would not be a springtime just for indigenous peoples, quote unquote, because from the indigenous worldview in which we share with our relatives uh, in many places in the world who, who understand this, truly, we are one human family. We are one human family. And the hurt of one is the hurt of all. And the honor of one is the honor of all. And that's why, as well, according to our teachings, that all of us, every one of your ancestors, who you spiritually represent, every person that, that spoke today, you spiritually represent every ancestor clear back to the beginning, before the beginning of recorded time. And so we are a sovereignty, each of us, ancient and perishable and everlasting. And so we all sat before the sacred fire of life, sat there. We all were nourished by the same mother earth, the same, oh, the womb of the same mother, the water of, of, on her breast, all these things. So we're all children of one mother, one father. As it says in the Quran, we're just all one, come from one clot of blood. And therefore, <clears throat> Um, we use a term because of the United Nations called indigenous people, but really all of us, every one of us is an indigenous person of mother earth. And this oneness, this compassion that opens the door to this understanding is so key at this time in history, because we can see they have built incredibly powerful weapons that can destroy every bit of human life on this Mother Earth. Mother Earth will continue in one form or another. But it's not Mother Earth that is sick. It's we are sick as a human family. And this is what I believe the great uh, uh, message that I've heard me for many, many years from His Holiness Dalai Lama, who I got a chance to uh, send a, a message from Assisi, Italy in 1984 when his uh, primary abbot came to a gathering we had with the World Wildlife Foundation in Assisi, Italy, where, the, where world leaders, spiritual leaders, and environmental leaders, and others came together to talk about, about this very compassion we have to have for Mother Earth. And the Dalai Lama at that time sent a whole delegation of, 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 of these incredible uh, relatives who had these long horns. I'll never forget that. And they, this, they, they echoed out through Assisi. Uh, and we prayed together and we came together as one with compassion in our hearts for all. Now, once we understand we have one human family, this is the foundation for this new world that's being birthed as we speak. Because once you realize we're one and the hurt of one is the hurt of all, there is no room whatsoever for any form of prejudice, any form of prejudice, anything that causes us to feel less than or better than another human being will be in this process completely erased from the consciousness and the hearts of the human family because it's an illusion. It truly is a spiritual, uh, it's, it's Maya, it is an illusion. We are one, no matter how we've been conditioned. When we come to this world as a little child, 
we are in that state of oneness. We see the world. We've even been given the gifts that every single human child, if a child from China is taken and raised by, by parents in uh, um, France, they'll speak French. If they have three or four languages being spoken around them uh, since birth, they'll speak those four or five languages by the time they're five. We have been completely given the gifts to manifest what's happening now, and that is to come into our full spiritual maturity as a human family. So those prophecies of the reunion of the condor and eagle really said that after the spiritual winter time, that this great time of a spiritual waking would come, a spiritual springtime, and that at that time, we would meet from all over the world others who have kept sacred this sacred understanding of the oneness uh, of all human beings. In fact, not only the oneness, but the prior unity and oneness of the human family. That is, we come from oneness. We, when you meditate, uh, when you meditate and go down to the depths of meditation, you are at one. You are at peace. You are finding that which connects all things. And so uh, I, don't, I believe even had not what happened in Tibet not happened, His Holiness the Dalai Lama would not have brought all these teachings to everyone. Everything in the end is for the, our own perfecting. Now, I want to go on too long, but I do want to bring to your, to your attention an incredible, incredible prophecy being fulfilled in this, on the Standing Rock Indian Reservation. Now, as I shared with you, uh, there was 100 million indigenous people living across the Americas at the time when we all predestinately came here, those that did. And by the time that we were entering the 1700s, already at least 70 million people had died mainly from diseases they didn't even know where they came from. And that's, this, this is a good book to read, 1491. And this continued until finally, uh, at the end of this process, probably 90% or 90 million people had been lost through disease, through, through uh, massacres, through all, you know, giving people smallpox blankets, etc., enslaving them along with our relatives from Africa and so forth. So now I want to say this, that uh, this is not about anybody feeling guilty because you know that His Holiness the Dalai Lama as a young boy and as a, a uh, older gentleman takes the time where they had to go through tremendous spiritual disciplines. And so what our elders tell us and what I have know from experience from my little journey in this life of 72 years is that if you're, if you are oppressed or we go into our ceremony, I've sun danced where you go f for two days and two nights nonstop in the hot heat of the sun or three days and, and one night, or f there's also four days and four nights and we fast for four days and four nights with no food or water. And then after that we pierce uh, and are tied to a tree Anyway, it's a beautiful ceremony, but we really, really are going to a sweat lodge uh, where it's extremely hot. But if you continue to pray and to meditate and to, to feel, give compassion and love, even though it's hard sometimes, when you get done with that ceremony, you come out, you're a different person. You are not the same person. Every morning when you meditate, as I know you, each of you do, as a practice, and you take that time to quiet yourself. And, you know, they say, you know, there's a space between the thoughts. And as we breathe up to the top of our breath, there's a space. In the bottom of our breath, there's a space. And then in between the thoughts, there's a space. And as we go into that space every morning, we take the time to discipline ourselves, to tune in, to connect with that everywhere spirit. That every day when we come out of that meditation, we're a little bit different, day by day by day. And as well, there's times when there's rapid transmission, where you go through a winter where it all seems like snow, but underneath that, those seeds are germinating. 
And all of a sudden comes the spiritual springtime and those seeds burst out. All of a sudden the winds come and the water rushes through these frozen streams. And it seems like if you didn't understand the process of life, we're at the end of the world. I mean, literally, boom, this power comes. So what we know from our holiness, the Dalai Lama, and other great spiritual beings, is this whole practice of sharing and giving, and the privilege of sharing and giving without expectation, the, the capacity to, to feel, feel others and to feel their suffering. Not because we're, we just want to suffer all the time. We get enough of that just naturally. <laughs> we want to be joyful and happy beings. That's our purpose. At the same time, in that we want to bring that happiness and joy and touch the hearts of others because it's our spiritual presence. It's our very consciousness itself that causes the transformation around us. You can talk all you want. But if you haven't been to where you want to bring people, you can't bring them there. We always say, unless you've gone up and fasted for four days and four nights, you can't take somebody to fast for four days and four nights. In a Sundance, there's somebody that pierces you. And, and, and uh, unless you've been pierced, you can't pierce. So we have to then become the living models of what the change is that we want to see. And that's where I think... Uh, when I met Brother John, uh, and I have to say, he, he, to me, is a real hero of mine. He's a real inspiration role model of mine, uh, even though he's a little bit younger. Uh, but, but at 68, he still looks good. Um, <laughs> but John, I think you could, you could share, just quick, you say it so beautifully, the preamble of our 16 principles yeah. for building a peaceful, harmonious, and compassionate world. You no, know, it's true. When I met Phil with the Dalai Lama, the Seeds of Compassion, he shared with me 40 years of consultation amongst indigenous leaders had led to an articulation of 16 guiding principles for building a peaceful and harmonious world. And those principles are summarized in the statement that for me is timeless, starting from within, working in a circle, in a sacred manner, we heal and develop ourselves our relationships and the world. Starting from within, working in a circle, in a sacred manner, we heal and develop ourselves, our relationships in the world. And that has been guiding the work on compassion that we've been doing ever since I heard that. And, um, you know, I was so moved, Phil, when the, La the Dalai Lama fellows spoke, they all said they wanted to hear from each other as well, mm -hmm. what their thoughts were about mm -hmm. compassion and unity at this time. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Only last thing I want to add real quickly is please, uh, when you have a, if you have a chance, follow what's happening in Standing Rock because what's happening there is unprecedented, unified action that's impacting the entire world. And it's never occurred in history that over 250 tribes, many which had been in an adversarial position, especially when they were being pushed together and pushed off their land during the process of colonization, are, have come together in unprecedented unified action to protect the water, to protect the land, to protect all the sacred to Mother Earth, our current generations, future generations, and also our sacred sites, our burial grounds. And this is not just for our indigenous people or the Standing Rock Sioux tribe. This is for all members of the human family because all of us are related to one another. So I thank you so much. I'm gonna close with uh, what all our Dakotas say when we get done speaking. We say our names and we say this. Shunkmano Hemeyodo, Shunapasapa Hemeyodo, which means, Shunapasapa Hemeyodo, which means my name, is a leader of warriors who takes the best, he takes the enemy's best horses, in short means horse thief. And my name is Chinupasapa, a sacred black pipe born of thunder, lightning, and rain, or in short, black pipe. And this is the key. And I stand responsible for all of my words and all of my actions. How Michante Washte. Oh. 
Mm. All right. I'd love to hear from any of the fellows who want to share their perspective on the role of compassion in creating global unity at this time. And this is intergenerational dialogue. That's why I thought this was so perfect. And if you wish to speak, just let us know. You can raise your hand or just start talking. Mm. Alec? I know, I had a feeling too. I don't know why, I, I thought you had something feeling. to say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Yes. I can say something. Oh, sure. wow. Yeah, so my name is Majak. I go, more is my first name, but I go by Majak. Um, I think, um, when I think of compassion, I think one of the most important thing, and this has already been mentioned, is starting with it. But I think the biggest problem that we face today is indifferent. Um, or pretending to be real busy. I think most people have lost touch with um, uh, the rest of the world. So we see, but we don't really, we don't see things that happen around us. So we, we hear, but we, we don't really pay attention to them. And I think if we want to live compassionately, I think it started with us being able to, you know, um, listen to things that happen around us and pay attention to those and be able to internalize them and, and and start searching why they're happening. I think if we if we cannot get out of our mind and the fact that we, you know, in the U.S. there's this, and when we introduce ourselves, you know, we say what we do, and I think we are really occupied with, you know, who we are and like what we do and how they define us. That we we don't listen to others. Not only what they do, but their suffering and the things that they could that they that they need to. So I think just being able to get out of our mind and more or less listen or have have the time to be silent. I think one of the reasons we fear silent is sometimes when you're silent, you, you get you, you get to experience things you don't when you're abusing, when you occupy yourself. So being silent and being able to, you know, try to think through things that happen around us, the painful stuff, but also the good stuff. Um, Matak, do you want to just share... Um a little bit about your background, where you're from, and... Yeah, sure. Uh, so right now I am going to uh, school at Notre Dame in Indiana. I'm originally from South Sudan. Um, I was born in Jonglai State, uh, one of the 10 states in South Sudan. Um, but I left South Sudan in 2005 and I went to Kenya. I live in Kenya. A refugee camp for about six years. I went there mainly to uh, access education because education wasn't very much uh, available in South Sudan. Um, and in 2011, I I had an opportunity to apply to a school in South Africa called African Leadership Academy, which is um, the goal of the school really is to try to the founding, the, the founding members believe that the biggest problem in Africa is they don't have ethical leaders. Um, so they try to bring together students from different parts of the continent and try to make them think through the problem that the continent face and, and how, as young generation, we can think ethically about how to, how to deal with those. Um, yeah, so I think that's a little bit about me. And then in 2013, I came to Notre Dame and I've been here. Right now, I'm... I'm a 2015, 2015 Dalai Lama fellow, right? Uh, I think 2015. Uh, yeah, that's about me. Beautiful, mm-hmm. beautiful. Thank you. Who else would like to share? Yes, please. Um, I personally think that right now we, we face many challenges um, also about um, people holding power very tightly. Um, and I, I really think that we, we miss compassion going towards and from those who are holding a lot of power. So politicians, um, for example, um, and um, a lot of people that really are not are making decisions based on greed instead of compassion and um and also not not only thinking about humans but as this earth as a whole animals and um everyone that that is uh, 
living on this planet. Um, and I, I think that if we see compassion as, a, as something holistic um, and be more connected to nature and to other animals and to our community, um, then we really get something uh, powerful. Yeah. Because compassion can go beyond um, borders and, uh, and greed. Uh, and I think it would be really, really wonderful um, to have it fostering uh, more community in, in this world. You know, one thing I want to share, if you guys don't know this, that the Dalai Lama recently visited with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And one of the mayors there, Mayor Greg Fisher, who I mentioned earlier, had a unanimous resolution two years ago on compassion as effective public policy. And actually, Santa Clara County, because part of why we're out here for the kickoff of the games, is their goal is to have every city in Santa Clara County, there are 15 cities, affirm the Charter for Compassion and become the first compassionate county. And I just pointed that because of you talking about the powerful, and the policymakers and public officials and how compassion is working into that conversation. In fact, the Dalai Lama has offered to help Mayor Fisher and our team establish a city, a, a center for compassionate cities in Louisville, Kentucky. So you should know that that's being heard. And of course, Dr. Goodall's work and, and recognizing all life as sacred Mm -hmm. and, and that includes all living beings. And so I thank you, Nathalia, for making that point, for both those points, because I think it is bottom up, it is top down, it is the outside in, but it all again starts from the inside out and, and that holistic view. John, I want to mention just one thing <clears throat> that I should have mentioned at the very beginning. Elder sister, uh, Jane Goodall, really wanted to be here, but her schedule did not allow it. You know, she was formally adopted in my family and my father gave her the name Makoji Najiwi, uh, which means st stands up for the natural world woman. And I know she would love to be here. She will be on a further uh, time. We're going to schedule another time in her, in her schedule. But, you know, I just wanted to remember her, Makoji Najiwi. She's just, an as you know, just great, great, incredible woman who's in her 80s who travels 300 days a week on behalf of uh, all life on Mother Earth. So I uh, just wanted to put that in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you, Phil. Thanks for reaching out with her. Thought to see her. Who else would like to share? Yes, please. Would you let me unmute you? Aha, we can hear you now. Hi. Hi. Um, so, so like I mentioned earlier, I go to school at NYU Abu Dhabi and um, one of the things that I really, really love about going to school here is that because we have such an international student body, um, people's conceptions of what is beautiful and what is normative has expanded significantly. Would you hold on one second? I want to unmute you. Okay, I muted everyone so we could just hear you. No, I didn't. Okay, should I start over? Or I mean, can one I... second. Ah, maybe it's you, Ritu. Okay, go ahead. Okay, should I start over? Yeah, or... I think it's oh. a little noisy where you are, but it's okay, we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I was saying that, so I go to school um, at NYU Abu Dhabi, and because we have such an international student body, I, at least in my experience, I've noticed that most students' conceptions and ideas of what is beautiful or, you know, what is normative has broken down, which means that, um, like, it's my, my understanding and the understanding of my peers of beauty has significantly expanded. And it's, it's just amazing to see the way people are kind to themselves when they're in a community where any kind of face is beautiful. And when you're kind to yourself, you're kind or to those around you. Yeah, beautifully said. Beautifully said. Thank you. 
Who else wants to share? Yeah. I think. Ah, hello. Listen. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, where are you? Yeah. Okay, got you. Sadaf. Okay. All right. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, hold can on. You? Hold on. Okay. Okay. So many want to talk at the same time. It's a good thing. All right. All right, Sadaf, you're unmuted. Go ahead. All right. So talking about compassion, when we talk about, when we say that we want to cultivate compassion, compassion automatically, uh, you know, um, um, forces us to think that we, all of us are interdependent and make, we make a conscious effort to make sure that uh, we, uh, see the world united. I mean, to see the world, um, I mean, to ensure global unity. You know, compassion helps us to take action to ensure global unity. Uh-huh. Well yes. said, that is really, that's great. That's a, that's a tweet. You said it in a tweet. Yeah. We need to add that into the mission. Yeah, yeah we got to put that That's in. Yeah. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but every day we're sending out missions. If you haven't signed up, and today it's Unleashing Generosity. There's a fabulous film that uh, Moving Art, Louis Schwartzberg, and Oprah Winfrey have done called Gratitude Revealed. And um, mm-hmm. if you haven't signed up, you should have gotten the mission if you have, and it's on that topic. Beautifully said. Okay, so who else would like to share? I'm going to have to unmute somebody here. Aha. Meta Marley Rose. All right. I think really quick. I think Blessing's ah. been waiting for a couple. Oh, couple, go ahead. So far. Oh. Oh, what was that? So, is someone has been waiting. Oh, Blessing. Okay. Yeah. Blessing. Where is Blessing? Oh, right here. Yeah, Blessing. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Blessing, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Alex, for pointing that out. I really have very little time to stay with, connected with you because I have a meeting in a short while. So I'll just share my view. First of all, um, what I really want to, I really want to thank, use this time to thank you for for inviting us to the call and also to thank um, the DLF once again for the great inspiration and motivation I got during our ethical leadership assembly meeting early this um, July this year. I think uh, one of the problems we are facing globally or as humanity is one that um, human has forgotten, uh, should I say, our responsibility as human. And that is one of the major problems we are facing. What is our responsibility? One is um, to love God, which is our first creator, and then to love our fellow human being, to love anyone around us and i think uh, the problem right now is that we are chasing other things money you can call it power influence we are chasing our own self myself my opinion what i think my decision and that is one thing that uh, majak mentioned very well it feels that everyone is so busy and we have eyes we can see really what is happening around us yes we can hear or pay attention to really what is happening around us. And I feel like if you have that love, not just for the one, someone around us, or for our own self, then we could be able to take up the compassion on those people. So compassion we can when we first love. And then the compassion willingly will give us the motivation, the ability to act on it, to, to the, that, that feeling of trying to alleviate someone's suffering and seeing them in being free from such, such suffering. So I think that is one of the things we are facing um, in the world. And during the ethical leadership assembly was something I experienced. It was a love I've been craving for, a kind of thing I've been trying to see and seeing people from various backgrounds, seeing people from different, with different languages, maybe different perspective. But in that one week, we are able to co exist or live together a kind of shared love that you couldn't imagine i felt like i was in a different world altogether and the story i think the last day we co-created was pointing out in building a new world a world where we could actually take this love out and i think it was what gave me power to start up a new project which i already started which is the global movement for love 
peace and um, and justice. I think um, if we human would go back to this first responsibility that we have, which is that love, and then try it once again for years globally, we've been trying. Um, should I say violence, war? to quench uh, or should I say to combat wars or to combat hatred we will be trying judgment accusation I think it should be time for us it is time for us to try peace to try love to try compassion towards one another and see what what it will lead us to I think it will be better because many people will face so many suffering we face so many pains tears and all that both from children from the youth from the old ones, I think it is time for us to try love and compassion. And I thank you for bringing up this, uh, making this opportunity for all of us to be able to, to connect and discuss this. I'm so happy. Thank you, blessing. Beautifully said. Mm. Awesome. All right, who else? Alex. Marley, did you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I gotta go, so. Okay, uh, go for it, Marley. I actually have a question um, anyone can answer, but more in regards to talking about these policies. When I was humbled to see the Dalai Lama for his birthday a couple of years ago in Orange County, the mayor was really excited of Anaheim. He was like, we're going to make this this compassionate city. And the Dalai Lama really responded like, that's really beautiful. But you guys are now the like city of nonviolence. So like, what are you really going to do? And like, what does that really look like? And so for me, um, I'm about to leave and go to a rural development class. I'm looking at and concerned and just curious, like, what is this compassionate movement in economics and policy? In Louisville, I've heard, in Louisville, like, I've heard so much amazing stuff going on there and around, not just there in Santa, Santa Clara, Santa Clara? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Santa Clara, okay. mm -hmm. San Jose and yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it sounds like it work and I see it in action. And I'm still kind of curious, like, what does that look like, you know, in the mean, in the sense of like development, because I'm, I'm not seeing a huge shift. And not that we're going to see a huge shift, because as we know, transformation just doesn't work that way. And then if it does, it's very violent. Um, but I'm still curious, because, you know, when we look at Standing Rock, and I've been following it closely as well. You know, these things are happening all over the world, whether we're talking about pipelines or hydro dams, and it's happening quickly, and there are some serious plans for the world that are, I mean, there's no compassion in those plans, and, it's, and they're very serious plans that are being, you know, thought out and pushed through in a very um, forceful way, as we see at the, the lines of Standing Rock, how just this, so I'm just curious, I'm sorry for the long-winded question, um, if you could speak to that a little bit and around, um, yeah, how to work with that, because what we're up against isn't, you know, people, people inside are compassionate, you know, there might be some stuff around that, that we've gone through ancestrally or in this life. Um, but there's kind of a system that's in place that um, counteracts it. And I'm just curious, like a little bit, if you could speak to that, or if you have seen practices or examples of like how compassion and these places have shifted development or whatnot. Yes, I'm happy to tell you I have. That's part of that's been <laughs> the, what keeps me <laughs> going at these challenges yes. that we face. There is a term of art called collective impact, right? And what I learned first about that from the Stanford Social Innovation Review. I thought that was a great idea, but I didn't know how we were going to make that happen. They say there are five conditions necessary to create a collective impact. There needs to be one, a shared agenda, right? And then there needs to be some common measurement system that everyone agrees upon. How are we going to know we're making progress, right? Because people want to say compassion is a great idea, but how do I know that we're really making strides toward being more compassionate? And how do we create ways to mutually reinforce each other's activities? That was the third idea because there's so many silos, so many separate independent expressions of what we're talking about. How do we unite them together and not dissipate our energy? How do we keep the communication flowing is the fourth one. And how do we build a platform upon which we see this happening? And look at what's going on right here, right? Look at this fact that we can convene like this. We've never had this capability before. And the games offered us a simple way to put forward this idea of measuring. 
So we measure service. We count the number of volunteers, the hours of service, number of people served, the money raised for local causes. But check out things like the Social Progress Index, okay? The same idea of co-opetition. There's wisdom. The economist, one of the, the editors said, well, why aren't we competing on social strength as opposed to just gross domestic product, right? There's a recognition that we're sick. We're sick. Greed is infecting us. And it's, 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 it's brought us to a point where things have gotten so bad that I think their recognition is growing. What you saw happen in, with the support for Bernie Sanders in the United States, a growing awareness that our institutions are collapsing and they need to be remade. And I'm sure others have examples. The compassion games have been played in the prisons in California. If you go on our site, look on the report map. If you go to compassiongames.org and click on report, you'll see expressions of compassion all over the world and how communities realize that we need to organize to create just and lasting change. And it's got to start bottom up, but it's also got to come top down, that outside in where we can take best practices from all over and share. And then it all starts from the inside out. It's, that is our kind of four-way approach to addressing the challenges that we're facing. And I know everyone on this call sees examples of it, but now that we can share them with each other and there's a new medium for communicating and organizing, at Facebook, we were just with these folks, they have a team dedicated to compassion. If you did not know that, the compassion team at Facebook, they're dealing with sensitive life events, relationship breakups, they're dealing with suicide prevention, we have these new platforms. And if you've noticed in the last year or so, Facebook's not just a utility anymore. They're trying to lean in and be more sensitive to what's going on in the human experience and how they, as a medium for communication, can be more responsible for making an impact. There is a growing awareness that we need to change our direction. Or we're going to wind up where we're headed. And I don't want to take more time, but I tell you, Mark, there is more good news coming. And, and this is one example of it. And you guys are a living testimony to what's possible with intergenerational act. Go ahead, Alan. Yes. If I could just say a quick thing, something that I've noticed and studied throughout my college experience, I just graduated this past year, um, is the control that corporations have and a lot of the greed and a lot of the uh, paths that humans are taking, I think are in part guided by these giant corporations who just care about the bottom line money. Um, that's what you're seeing with the pipelines. That's what you're seeing with a lot of the uh, massive projects that are destroying many areas that should be kept sacred. Um, and something that I found important is to try to work with youth to reshift their views on the role of corporations and the role of materialism in their lives. Um, a lot of the work that I've been doing recently has been talking with youth and working with youth in development settings to shift their focus to a more compassionate model and to be conscious consumers and to be aware of the choices they make and the standards they hold their companies and corporations to. Yeah. Uh, because I, you know, it's not necessarily realistic to say we just can't have those big entities here anymore um, because I feel like they'll be around for a very long time. Um, but if we can start from the youth perspective of reshaping how we as consumers view those corporations. Um, that's something that I've found on a smaller scale can yield larger results. Yep. No, we vote with our dollars. 70% of the GDP is in the hands of the consumer. Alec, you're making a really important point. I think, Phil, I saw you typing. You wanted to share something here? Just, just briefly. I'd like to know of all the fellows here on the call that are going to, uh, are in the United States or Canada, how many of you know directly indigenous people from there, Native Americans or Aboriginal people in Canada? How many, how many of you have a direct working relationship or connection? Yeah. Raise your hands, I guess is the, yes. What, what I really want to encourage is an act of unity is that the Amer I'm an elder, a member of the Elders Council for the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. It's called ACES. They have a chapters in over a hundred different um, you, major universities and colleges, every college and university, all the, all the uh, uh, schools on the East Coast, West Coast, Stanford, Harvard, everywhere, to the smaller schools, uh, they all, all have chapters. And it would really, really be a wonderful act of compassion to reach out and just tell them 
you met Uncle Phil. You say Uncle Phil. Uh, Uncle Phil from the Elders Council uh, and a compassion game. So you just wanted to come and say hello and give him greetings and tell him what you're doing because it's coming together directly uh, of your one act that has to happen is this unprecedented unified action. You know, if you come and really, truly, if you're, if you're from someplace else, you need to find out what tribe's land you're on because that's their land and it's proper to give proper respect and protocol to those peoples whose land you're on. So if you go to them and say, you know, I just want to come and give respect to you. I know you're the uh, original peoples of this land. Uh, I've, I've met Uncle Phil, who's on your elders council, ASIS elders council. And we just really like to hear what you're doing. Uh, and I'd like to share what we're doing. Make relationships with as many relatives as possible. That is something directly you can do right where you are. Because it's through this making these relationships, you have the strength and foundation to address what Alex so wonderfully talked about. And that is the fact that we're dealing with these, this huge uh, multi military industrial complex, huge, huge. But the thing is, it's fracturing everywhere. It's fracturing everywhere. And your generation, we call the seventh generation, very, very strongly prophesied that you as a seventh generation who now represent over 50% of the entire 7.2 billion human beings on this planet, you have a destiny. And that destiny is you will see before you have the white hair like me, the total transformation of this mother earth into something that is beyond even our, our the greatest poets, the greatest uh, spiritual teachers, traditions, it is truly a place where we're moving to, and we're moving to it very, very rapidly. And there's going to be some real uh, resets happen in the economic system. Major events are going to unfold to this year, right before us. We don't know what's going to be the next one, but they're going to happen yeah. because that is where we're going. Yeah. So a couple things. So Phil did offer to set another time with Dr. Goodall, okay? And I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We thought we'd take a half hour, maybe 45 minutes, and we've been on the call over an hour. Okay? Oh. No, no, and, 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 I, and I'd stay forever, okay? But I don't want people to feel bound to unless, yeah, yeah and we've got, we're, we've got a call with the other team organizers in 20 minutes, so. But who else would like to share? Is there anything else in part? Those are beautiful words, Phil. That's what kind of inspired me. So, yes. boy, it's hard to speak after uh. that. But if anyone has a burning share, anything they want to share, I don't want to miss the chance to anyone to speak. Yeah, that's to hear so many of you. Ah, okay, wait, David, I see you. Hold on. That 617 number. 617. Yeah, there you go. Hold on. David, you're on. Hey, thanks. Um, I just wanted to say briefly, I actually have to run uh, rather than that I work a bit today. And uh, I haven't been able to speak too much on the one call because we're in a, a shared workspace in the sort of side room here. Um, it's been great to connect with everyone here, different perspectives on um, what it even means to understand the, the purpose of compassion, the understanding of compassion from different points of view around the world and fill your perspective, uh, really um, urging us to understand um, what's happening in Standing Rock. I just want to thank you for that. And I'll look forward to hearing from everybody moving forward. Uh, but fortunately, you have to run. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thanks, David. Okay. Anybody else or is it good? Should we close the call here? Yeah. Um, right. I can yeah, yeah. Wait, there's a few. Elizabeth, yeah. let me unmute you, Elizabeth. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Elizabeth, you're on. I think Kunal wanted to speak first, so. Uh, it's, okay. it's okay. It's okay. Go ahead. You're all so sweet to each other. Yes. So compassionate. How compassionate you fellows are. <laughs> <laughs> right, Elizabeth, then we'll go to Kunal. Okay. Um, well, thank you for everyone for sharing your wisdom and insights, and um, I really appreciate it. Um, I think just one thing I wanted to add that I've been learning more from some of the work that I do um, at the Olive Tree Initiative at UC Irvine um, and the work with the Dalai Lama fellows is um, that like a practice that I've been starting to do more is um, like a deep desire to, to understand others um, in a way that like, if you like momentarily suspend your disbelief in another person's um, belief systems or what they're speaking, then I think it can bring uh, a point of connection that might not otherwise have had. Mm -hmm. And so it's a way I think to humanize other and then explore what, um, 
what kind of conclusions and decisions can be made from there. Um, and I think one of the key things that I've been hearing from this call is um, having a, just on a side note, like a, a deep sense of reverence for nature and living being, beings as a key to um, connection and living mindfully um, and being present too. The Dalai Lama fellows have this great concept of um, post-heroic leadership and ambition, which is humility and ambition combined. Um, that I think is coined from Marty Kras. I love that. I love that. Mm. Beautiful. Uh, and it's really about um, using yourself as a, as a leader or empowering a group and making a self-sustaining system that isn't dependent upon one person. Um, mm where you are not like the focus of um, the attention and the, the action, but it's about what can the community do as a whole. So, yeah. mm. I just wanted to share that. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Kumar. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Okay. I keep unmuting you and you are muting. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, yeah, it works correct this time. So yeah, for, for me, compassion is like uh, being able to connect to you, all of you who are here right now at this moment, because some of you I know I'm so like happy to see some faces that I've met at the ELA. I'm excited to be meeting them again next year. And some of you I don't know, but I still feel like I know you. Mm -hmm. That is compassion for me, like being able to connect, like just see you guys and like, and being able to feel what you guys are saying and at least try to feel what you guys are saying and like so i feel that uh, it's a big family and i feel connected to it it's just that sometimes we lose sight of where we are going as human beings like to be able to connect to people like mazak initially said about not having time uh, maybe like how like marley also had questions about the development and how we de define development is different for everyone like it depends from perspectives that we look at it. Like our worldviews may be different of how people look at development. And today how most of the nations are looking at development is, 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 is very different, but we are getting there like to have, have a view of development, which is for the entire world. And it's like, like the concept of development for an indigenous person would be different as compared to someone who's staying in a metropolitan city. And, but still, like if if I if I go in factories or BPO centers or call centers in India, or, or you know factories which had been sweatshops, and over there I see people working, and I feel that that is wrong. Even that is compassion. Like to start off with, seeing people in bad conditions, seeing Mother Earth, that it, like it's like we just exploiting things and not being able to connect to it. So I feel really great and i'm really thankful that you guys made me feel connected to you guys and thank you for giving me that opportunity that i could connect even to people who i did not know and i felt that i knew all of you who was there in this call today beautiful beautiful thank you yeah, mm. yeah. i see your comment phil thank you reminding us that the honor of one's the honor of all and the hurt of one is the hurt of all we are all connected and also um she felt shared uh, walking the red road is the Facebook page to um, really find out information about what's happening in uh, Standing Rock. And then we also, if you didn't see, we put the link for where to sign up for the Global Unity Games. If those of you who haven't signed up yet, you can go to that landing page, which is on the in the, on the chat. chat. All right. Who else? Anybody else? Everybody's welcome to, and no one has to. All right, aha. Uh -huh. Kimberly, let me unmute you. You're on. Yeah, I just want to add something. Um, if Jane will be here, uh, <laughs> she will explain it better. But for me, uh, compassion knows no bounds, no boundaries. So I just want to remind that the animals also are compassionate beings and to achieve global unity uh first of all we must become one with nature and then we can become as a one human family i just want to add this. yes thank you yes as i said 
All right. Bella, what do you think? Aha. Wait, hold on, Bella. I had you. Yeah. Made. I'm just, um, this has been so heartwarming mm -hmm. um, and truly inspiring to see all of you. Um, and even though it's virtual, it's amazing. I feel like I'm, I'm in community um, with such beautiful hearts. Thank you, so much, I, thank you so much, John, um, and everyone at Compassion Games for, um, you know, just all the work um, behind this, but more than that, your intention for this, um, which I think has the force behind all of this happening in the way that it has. Mm -hmm. um, and so much gratitude for um, sharing this with Dalai Lama Fellows. Um, and all the all of the fellows in this community. Um, I hope that maybe this is just um, a seed that we've planted this morning and it um, continues to blossom into um, more connection. Um, yeah. Now it's perfect you would say that. Um, we had the good fortune to have Nemo, uh, Nemo Patel. And oh. Yeah, he was on the other day and he was, uh, we were listening to one of his songs and. He was yeah. at uh, the Dalai Lama's, uh, at, the, at Gandhi's ashram. And yes, he's a friend of mine. I know him. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh world. And he, uh, he, we were listening to the song, Planting Seed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it would be, what I'd love to do is end it with that song, okay? Because it was the seeds of compassion that uh, first inspired me because of his holiness. And I'd love you guys to at least have this song as we leave. It's so beautiful. And uh, hopefully you're going to start to see it on my, your screen. You see something there? Can you see it? And yeah. I hope we... Okay. Hold on. Okay. And I'm so grateful to everyone for making time for this. It's been a long time running. I never knew that, but I know I know now that the fruits, they always come in. Takes a long time to show in. And the seeds then, look at them now. But the roots are always growing. <laughs> Whatever goes will go, whatever dies will die, whatever whatever flies will fly, whatever fails will fail, it's meant to soar, to soar, I am planting seeds, and that's like your whole life. You've been training for this moment, and when the time comes, you just own it. We need to just surrender, don't control it. Not interested in the clay pots and all this. And get next to the past, trying to unfold it. Or we can put the to all down for you. Let it go, and now you're going to feel it. Right, the horses bring it big steps away instead of towards it. Let it rush, feel the freedom with nothing to hold. We've been taught that what you touch will only turn to gold. And now we're learning to let it go. It overflows with no credit to take. There's no credit, it's all a higher power for getting deeper with the sea. Are sold, and when the seeds are true, then they seem to blow. When the real gold is sure, when life starts to flow, and when it does, you just start building out the hope. It's been a long time, but I never knew that. Like the fruit, they always come in, but you can go around just knocking them down. It takes a long time to show in. We plant the seeds then, and we look at them now. But the roots are always growing, no matter what they are. Come on. 
We are so grateful for this. I'll never forget this. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so That's grateful so for your work. Thank you, Brother Phil. Thank you, Bella. Thank you, every fellow that was here and those yet to come and those whose path we walk in. Have a beautiful day. Game Have on. Have a beautiful day and evening, everybody. Love you all. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Bye for Take now. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.